expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast. Distrust has reached new heights. 3.6 P4 micro sievert power. Firework festival in Japan. These pyrotechnic starbursts, the Japanese call hanabi, are almost universally appealing. The multicolored pulses of explosive light need no justification. Onlookers often seek no deeper meaning than the euphoria and excitement they stir in people of all ages. Festivals like these have been a much needed escape for a nation traumatized by the devastation of the March 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear triple meltdown in Fukushima. A welcome amusement in light of the harshness of recent events. That one might say such a display is a welcome distraction or a diverting experience could be interpreted though in a darker sense. These pyrotechnics just might trick us into believing that our eyes are all seen, that they can perceive all sources of light. In the wake of the largely forgotten Fukushima nuclear crisis, our eyes are false witnesses to the true nature of the ongoing tragedy, uncognizant of what is truly befalling Japan and much of the rest of the world. Our eyes are deceiving us. The Fukushima meltdown crisis has completely fallen off the agenda of the world press and government halls the world over. It has been more or less extinguished from the public mind, such as the stranglehold of the nuclear industry and the military-industrial complex. In fact, they have been largely intermarried with sovereign nations and the United Nations, the World Health Organization and the IAEA, to the point where nuclear power is not to be criticized or compromised, even in the face of the ongoing presence and accumulation of deadly radiation emanating from Fukushima. Germany is the only country to have laid plans for decommissioning its nuclear power plants. Similarly, the spellbinding, sometimes blinding firework displays are one could say a cruel misrepresentation of reality. All light is electromagnetic radiation and the small band of its spectrum that is visible to the human eye is but a fraction of all light that exists. At the higher end of the ultraviolet range exists the completely invisible but unspeakably deadly visitor 
celebrating its second anniversary of its arrival in Japan, ionizing radiation. Visited upon Japan via the hellish portal of the Fukushima meltdowns, ionizing radiation is made up of sufficient kinetic energy as to be able to liberate subatomic particles from atoms resulting in multi-generational mutations, cancers, radiation illnesses, and death. We are being fed a spectacular pyrotechnic puppet show, a cruel series of diversions in order to maintain the hegemony of nuclear power. The Fukushima radiation disaster is a global environmental and health disaster invisible to the human eye, operating on a timetable of not days or weeks or months, but years, decades, generations, challenging our much reduced attention spans in a mass media culture spun for spur of the moment, anything for a kick, commercially sensitive information. The Japan Times, with the ironic creed of all the news without fear or favor, reported recently about the attempts to purify contaminated water that has been used to cool the three melted-down reactors at Fukushima. The article treads carefully, but subtly suggests that the water indeed can be purified to the extent where it can be released into the ocean. An NHK documentary recently recreated the breathless events in the days after the March 11 earthquake at the Daiichi plant, but ultimately blames unforeseen equipment failures and not the lack of safety checks and equipment upgrades mandated by official regulations that were ignored by TEPCO and condoned by the Japanese government. Also not featured was the culpability of General Electric's reactor design and its cozy relationship with the IAEA and the US government nor is mention merited regarding the release of plutonium seawater into the Pacific. The omissions go on and on. Nuclear reality must be managed and massaged so that the nuclear power can be continued in Japan and around the world. On the second anniversary of the earthquake and nuclear meltdown, elements of the American media published quite ludicrous articles declaring the threat of radiation and contamination to be overblown, and even a positive thing in some regards. Already 40% of children in Fukushima have developed abnormal thyroid cysts. There have been three confirmed cases of thyroid cancer. While the three cancer cases may seem to be insignificant, it took residents of Chernobyl five years to develop similar cancers. A study written by Russian and Belarus experts and published by the New York Academy of Sciences concluded that over a million people have died thus far as a result of the Chernobyl disaster. It seems we are on track, ahead of schedule even, for a repeat of this death toll, but it seems more than likely that Fukushima will overtake Chernobyl in casualties, given that at the Fukushima meltdown there were three complete reactor meltdowns, not the one at Chernobyl and the multiple meltdowns occurred relatively close to densely populated regions of Japan. Within Japan there has been significant social dislocation due to the nuclear crisis. There have been numerous cases of families and individuals leaving Tohoku and surrounding areas. Some residents of Tokyo, notably Ichikawa and Urayasu, where radiation hotspots are most prevalent, have had a marked decrease in their populations. The,で、同時にそういう事態が生じると福島県からどんどん避難する人たちが出てきています。え、子供たちを抱えてる親を中心に、え、避難地域でない人たちももう避難すると。東京都も福島原発から250キロ圏にある東京都民でさえ東京から避難
radioactive debris across Japan is an attempt to spread the radiation as evenly across Japan as possible so that it distributes ensuing cases of cancer on such a broad nationwide scale that it absolves the nuclear plant owner TEPCO of inevitable lawsuits from parents with children with soon to be manifesting cancers in Fukushima. At the same time we hear I hear reports from Japan from mothers of children who say that they're showing all of the signs of contamination with cesium that were also found by my colleague Professor Yuri Bandashevsky after Chernobyl in the areas of Belarus that were contaminated similarly with this substance with cesium-137. What it did there was that it went into the heart muscle and it caused conduction difficulties and destroyed heart, heart muscle. So the children in, in, uh, in Belarus were suffering heart attacks and arrhythmias. That's when the heart doesn't beat properly. And of course later on in life they die young from heart disease because the heart cells don't replicate themselves. The heart cells, you get all of your heart cells at once. You get maybe 1% uh, increase in heart cells per year. But over the period of time we're talking about, there's going to be no replacement for the cells that were damaged by the Fukushima catastrophe in the children. Even scant optimistic signs of radiation recovery are deceptive and are false dawns. The badly damaged Reactor 4 building, whose collapse would release the equivalent of 85 times the amount of cesium given out by Chernobyl, is being slowly consolidated and shored up with the aim of constructing a crane to lift out the nuclear fuel rods inside. Mercifully, another large earthquake or tsunami has not threatened yet to bring down the structure, yet the fuel rods are still not secure. Sometime in 2015 is the earliest date by which all the thousands of nuclear fuel rods can be safely removed. Reactor 4 remains a nuclear powder keg, imperiling the whole of the northern hemisphere. It is a huge exclamation mark heaped on top of the existing and ongoing release of radiation into the Pacific Ocean and into the atmosphere, making landfall onto North America and beyond. Even the Japan Times reported that no progress really has been made with reactors 1, 2 and 3 in regard to nuclear fuel extraction. Work remains slow, lacking the urgency and priority that the situation merits. Structures are being built over the reactors. One commentator duly noted that these are being built in order to deploy cutting-edge technologies to extract the still melting nuclear fuel. Technologies, that is, that in fact do not yet exist. In the meantime, the fuel is free to burn like three miniature solar furnaces onto which TEPCO is pouring tons and tons of water daily. The water that does not escape through cracks into the groundwater below is stored until water storage capacity is exceeded, at which time TEPCO must dump the excess into the Pacific Ocean, presumably after being purified. It is unknown how much fuel has escaped beyond the realm of each reactor's containment vessel and has penetrated the reactor floor into the soil below. It is best described as a situation of nuclear standoff, with the melting fuel rods holding off their former human capitals, with continual bursts of radiation too dangerous for them to enter all the while holding the earth hostage beneath them, releasing radiation into the air, into the water table, and into the ocean unabated. Already, of course, Tohoku and Tokyo soil has two years of radioactive input that is staying put, even if further incoming radiation were stopped somehow today. But some things have been changing. That tremendous kinetic energy of ionizing radiation has distorted the DNA of these organisms to the point where it betrays its presence, a presence that would otherwise be invisible to human eyes. Plants and animals in North and Central Japan have shown unmistakable mutation development since the disaster. Sadly, but unsurprisingly, this mutation has been mirrored in North America and beyond. Some Japanese people have heeded the warning signs. 
there is a small number of Japanese radiation expatriates, or perhaps more bluntly put, radiation refugees. Though no government would legally recognize them as refugees currently, even though they face an invisible radiation persecution. It is difficult to ascertain their numbers, but it is a growing phenomenon for those Japanese who have the not inconsiderable financial means to move overseas. Not satisfied with merely moving to the western or southern regions of their country, some Japanese have opted to sever their physical bonds with their hometowns and homelands, so integral to their culture and identity. Today I am meeting with a Japanese woman who has relocated to Melbourne, Australia from Yokohama, Japan. Sachiko, not her real name, was reluctant to be filmed and to have her voice recorded. We spoke for an hour about the crisis and its effect on Japan, and broadly about her situation and her friend's experiences. At the time of the accident, she and her Australian husband and daughter were living in Australia, but shelved their plans to move back to Japan. Her friends and relatives contact her now and then asking about when they will return or visit them. Sachiko is evasive on the subject to them and will not give any future dates. She relates to me briefly the situations of four other newly arrived Japanese families in Melbourne that she meets regularly and mixes with. They all moved here because of the radiation the Japanese government says is benign. One of the families first fled to Okinawa, but with the contamination of the Pacific Ocean and the acceptance of contaminated food imports from Tohoku by the mayor of Okinawa, they decided to move on to Australia. Another family decided that the father should stay in Japan and work, so as to financially better sustain the mother and children's stay in Australia. Another mother divorced her husband, leaving him in Japan separating over differences of opinion on how to best protect the children. For Sachiko, the radiation peril has effectively split Japan into two halves, severing the social and cultural fabric. For working husbands and their families, company life is often synonymous with their family life. Before 311, most mothers would go along with their husbands' long absences, working late and entertaining clients on weekday nights and on weekends. The radiation has put this into a much different perspective and for more and more Japanese mothers it is no longer binding them so much to their work devoted husbands. The Guardian reported that there is a rising tide of Gen Patsuriko, radiation divorces in affected areas of North and East Japan and the densely populated Kanto area. Sachiko's parents and children in her area of Yokohama are getting sick more often. She believes also that the radiation aggravates existing illnesses and health conditions, as one might expect from radiation-weakened immune systems. The radiation has divorced the normal harmony-conscious Japanese themselves into two groups, the Anzenshu, those who believe the radiation is safe, and the Kikenshu, those who believe the radiation is dangerous. When I asked Sachiko about why she was not satisfied with merely moving away to the Kansai or Kyushu regions of Japan, she was unequivocal. She does not trust the Japanese government, believing them to be controlled by the US government, or better yet, the nuclear power lobby ensconced within the halls of Washington. After all, the Japanese government has successfully pressured governors all over Japan to incinerate nuclear waste in their prefectures and accept radiation-tainted food onto supermarket shelves. The Japanese Board of Education is forcing school children to eat and consume government-sanctioned school lunch boxes, kyushoku, laden with radiation-tainted food from the Fukushima area. Across Japan, there have been numerous reports and hearsay of children getting sick from eating kyushoku. This is what such girl's daughter would be eating daily if her parents had moved back to Japan. Yeah. 
給食も全然検査もされなくて最中だけじゃなくて大阪,大阪内のそうですね大阪も、はい、給,食給食を食べてる人は体調が悪かったりとかそうですか、はい、聞きますねうちは食べさせてないですけど When I asked why, despite the huge anti nuclear protests to date, the majority of Japanese people still do not protest or storm their government halls, she alluded to the oft spoken of Japanese dislike of being singled out as being different, let alone, heaven forbid, being seen as the slightest bit belligerent. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down in Japan. I heard this phrase many times while in Japan over many years before 311, at times believing it and sometimes less so, but I never thought it would apply as a pretext not to react in the face of such obvious radiological danger as that presented from three melted down nuclear reactors for fear of being different. Yet it has held fast. Despite the unprecedented schism in Japanese society between the Anzenshu and the Kikenshu, this rupture, along with the Genpatsuriko, has still not broken the unrivaled capacity of the Japanese to carry on in the midst of the radiation peril. After the earthquake, tsunami, and radiation disasters of 311, a powerful and overpowering trait arose among the Japanese. A simple translation of this trait. The Japanese call gamma would be perseverance. But a better summary is perhaps this enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. It is a term employed against the backdrop of severe adversity while always maintaining one's self control and self discipline without complaining or voicing doubts, collaborating together and burying one's own personal problems and deepest reservations. To achieve goals, often mistaken by uninitiated Westerners as mere weakness or timidity. The word it implies patience, it implies perseverance, it implies suffering in silence, really. And so, this, there's a value about being strong in difficult circumstances. So, there's actually a, a, a strong cultural under, underpinning of we don't panic, we, we don't freak out. We don't overreact. We, we strengthen ourselves and we do what needs to be done. Probably another word that I think is really relevant is the word atarimai, which means it's just the way things are. And atarimai kind of applies to people in the culture understand what you're supposed to do. And so those two words combine, it's just atarimai that people would gum on in these situations. You, You don't freak out, you figure out what needs to be done, and you do it, and you, you do it in peaceful calm, and you make sure everybody's taken care of. Gaman demonstrates maturity and a strong personal constitution, essential for overcoming challenges. It has guided Japanese through famines, invasions, wars, myriad natural disasters, and even the odd university entrance exam. It helped bring amazing economic recovery from the devastation of World War II, when in 1989 Japan's GDP briefly eclipsed that of the United States. Again, it has brought amazing recovery from the first two of the three March 11 disasters the earthquake and the tsunami, but it has not succeeded against the third the radiation. For good or for ill, Gaman sees the Fukushima radiation onslaught as little different to anything else Japan has faced. However, Gaman is passive, very deferential to authority, and it seems to be an end in itself, as if the mere exercise of this virtue will bring about good outcomes again and again. It is more conceivable, however, that Gaman has been used by the powers that be to manipulate the Japanese people into enduring through. What is indeed the unbearable? Ionizing radiation from Fukushima. For all the endurance of the Japanese people, the half life of cesium 137 is 30 years. The half life of plutonium is 24,000 years. And the cancers, mutations, and the health and genetic degradation can carry on for 20 generations after the first person is radiologically exposed. 
exposure that is being encouraged by Tokyo's policies. One of the most optimistic initial assessments was that the cleanup merely at the Daiichi plant would take 50 to 100 years in a region that could see another earthquake and tsunami in a heartbeat. The Fukushima disaster has just notched up its second year. It begs the question of how much chance does the health and sanctity of a valiant Japanese citizenry exercising gaman have in the face of these time spans against an enemy that is very very patient and able to hide in food, water, in soil and in the very air you breathe. This could be a culturally induced paralysis wherein the bulk of the people stay fixed and do not evacuate only to be overrun by an invader, an adversary they cannot or are not permitted to recognize. Journalist John Pilger once said that Japan is a nation of masks. One mask is tatemai, publicly displayed truth, employed at work or in public. And the other mask is hone, private truth, their true feelings spoken at home or at a drinking party. It is behind tatemai that they will often consent or acquiesce to harsh things. Regarding this willingness to defer to authority in spite of private reservations or resentment, the late Japan scholar Edward Seidensticker once lamented, They don't object. That is the heart of the matter. They take things, they accept things that to most of us would be intolerable. In order to glean how intolerable things may pan out to be if no real, urgent, popular and concerted response and a central Japan evacuation is made, one might find the story of the town of Minamata instructive and enlightening. The Minamata disease brought on by the release of mercury into the local waters is considered to be Japan's worst environmental pollution disaster. Disturbingly, it has some startling similarities and symmetries to the Fukushima disaster that threatens to supplant its place in history in spades. Like Fukushima radiation, the effect of the mercury on the people of Minamata had a considerable gestation period in which the citizenry and local authorities struggled to ascertain what it was that was causing the terrible illnesses and death. Chiso Corporation began releasing mercury into the waters in 1932. 24 years later, on April 21st, 1956, a five-year-old girl was examined at a hospital suffering from strange symptoms, difficulty breathing, walking, speaking, and experiencing convulsions. Two days later, her sister began suffering the same symptoms, marking the official beginning of the Minamata disease that destroyed so many lives and unborn fishermen's livelihoods, with ensuing compensation cases, of which some continue to this day. Such symptoms would typically escalate from numbness to an inability to grasp objects, inability to walk, see, hear, or swallow properly, thereon deteriorating into violent convulsions, comas, and death. Researchers from Kumamoto University concluded heavy metal poisoning to be the cause, resulting from, like the gradual effects of radiation and radioactive hot particles, a bioaccumulation of toxins in the body from specifically the consumption of affected local fish and shellfish. It was only in 1959 that a visiting British neurologist pointed out the symptoms resembled those of organic mercury poisoning. Although methyl mercury kills and maims in a completely different way to radiation attacking the central nervous system, the cynical and dismissive manner in which the authorities have handled both environmental disasters seems eerily similar. Chiso, like TEPCO, put up all manner of lies, obstruction and obfuscation in the face of this exposure to impede or limit compensation demands as much as possible. It conspired with the powerful government agency, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, and the Japanese Chemical Industry Association to research alternative causes of the disease that did not implicate Chiso's mercury waste disposal. Chiso 
built in a waste filtering system that the company knew from its own research had no effect on the waste content of its disposals, except as a placebo. Chiso President Kiichi Yoshioka drank a glass of water supposedly from the purification system to vouch for its safety. Chiso switched the location of its mercury release in order to confuse researchers attempting to pinpoint the source of the problem, but it then resulted in spreading the mercury over a greater area, inducing a second wave of illness. A congenital form of the disease developed that, like Fukushima plutonium, does not necessarily trouble the mercury exposed mother, but does affect the offspring born with the same symptoms of Minamata disease, along with cerebral palsy. Methyl mercury, like plutonium, is able to move through the placenta via the mother's bloodstream. Nevertheless, all of the Chiso Corporation's lies and obfuscation, like those of TEPCO and the Japanese government that aided and abetted them, are perfectly understandable from a criminal mastermind's point of view. Their actions, after all, are only rational responses designed to set the preconditions not for complete innocence or acquittal, but for plausible deniability. While it may not always avoid demands for compensation or policy changes, it can certainly limit or delay them for decades while the victims die off and the careers, prestige and agenda of the accused parties are shielded. For all the considerable protests of Japanese people to date at the restart of some nuclear reactors thus far, it has been typically placid and orderly. These chaotic and violent scenes from 1956 onwards, culminating in riots with protesters and unions, storming meetings and hearings, occurred only after myriad and horrific illnesses and deaths had already taken place. If we take 1932 as the year Minamata began, and the vociferous public outcry beginning after 1956, then in 2013, two years after the 311 meltdown, we are still very early in the gestation period where we are yet to discover and fully comprehend the scale and nature of the health disaster to hit. Yet such is the overwhelming scale and distribution of the radiation encouraged by Japanese government policy, it probably won't even take a decade for widespread cancers and deaths to become obvious. Even with the confirmed cases of thyroid cancer in Fukushima, children, even some adults suffering from dizziness, chronic fatigue, nosebleeds from Fukushima to Tokyo, myriad mutations of plants and animals, a peer-reviewed medical study confirming 14,000 American infant deaths in merely the one year from the meltdowns. There is still yet no official acknowledgement, either from Tokyo or Washington, of the role of Fukushima radiation. Fukushima is Minamata repeating itself. The question is how long will it be and how many will die before the problem is officially recognized. The Japanese government thus far have only deemed the health problems of Fukushima residents as psychologically induced, and Washington and the World Health Organization have still maintained that not one person has yet died from Fukushima radiation. For now, parents like Kenji and Aiko Nomura, who live in Fukushima, featured in the Guardian article, privately agonized to themselves while waiting for an unlikely government evacuation order. Is this the year one of our daughters will become sick? To labor an obvious point, this time the victims are not a small fishing town in southern Japan, but will be a global community that may easily resort to similar but wide-scale violence when met with the continual violence of government and corporate inertia empowering the deadly poisoning of its own people. The question is which 
and whose violence is more reprehensible? And could any violent reaction from the public be deemed as mere self-defence against a corporate government that will not stop kettling them in irradiated environs, not issuing evacuation orders for zones with clearly radioactive soil such as Tokyo itself, and killing them softly with lies and half-truths? As noble and admirable as Gaman is, it is still born of a human host. People can only endure so long until they either suffer and die from the contamination or fight back. Across the Pacific in North America, the lack of reporting on Fukushima, as well as a belief in the tyranny of distance that would normally keep Americans and Canadians safe to the point of dangerous complacency, have combined with a not so unique American cultural paralysis brought on by, for want of a better word, unconditional love. The unconditional love of pop slash football slash idol culture that largely preoccupies the mind of Westerners to induce, when all is said and done, the same sedated passivity as Japanese gaman in the face of a flood of very hot and irresistible Japanese imports, this time not from Sony or Toyota, but Tokyo Electric Power Company. These Americans are suffering from horrible traveling radiation exposure, not from Fukushima, but from electromagnetic radiation coming from their television sets, blasting radiological images within the visible range of the human eye, of their NFL teams losing and not making the Super Bowl. Whether it is gaman or pop culture, they result in the same thing, the control of large populations, so they remain in their radioactive killing zones. Kayukan is a marine aquarium which celebrates the environment and biodiversity of the Pacific Ocean. The name Kayukan, Ring of Fire, alludes to the volcanic fault line that virtually demarcates the outer limits of the huge oceanic expanse that is the Pacific Ocean. These plants, animals and organisms inhabit another radiation front line that is in the path of the ocean-going radiation from Fukushima. As the triple reactor meltdowns at Fukushima caused many uranium oxide fuel rods to heat up and melt, the many tons of seawater used to cool them down duly reacted with the uranium oxide to form what is called radioactive buckyballs, tiny microscopic nanospheres shaped like footballs, somewhat similar to an ICBM that can deliver nuclear warheads thousands of miles away. These buckyballs are impervious to dissolution by seawater. This microscopic delivery vehicle has been confirmed to be deploying uranium to the beaches of the west coast of North America, complementing the airborne radiation delivered by trade winds and precipitation. A ring of fire in every sense of the word. The term has come to shed meaning even beyond earthquakes, tsunamis, and the new kid on the block, that is Fukushima radiation. Already beset by earthquakes and radiological disasters, Japan finds itself in what has been described as an economic ring of fire by economists who include debt in their economic models and thus were able to predict the beginning of the global financial crisis in 2008. Japan joins the United States, the United Kingdom and Greece as nations that have accumulated unsustainable levels of debt to GDP. Though each of these nations' massive overarching debts have unique characteristics, Japan stands alone as the worst in the class, with a debt equal to an unbelievable 200% of its annual GDP. Kyle Bass is a highly respected fund manager who has been seeing some nasty writing on the wall and makes some very fearful predictions. Bass sees hyperinflation is a very likely imminent scenario as the Bank of Japan will have to keep printing money 
in a forced devaluation of the yen, wiping out the retirement savings of millions of retired and soon to retire Japanese and the economic prospects of their ever dwindling numbers of young workers. And now I think they're about to engage or, or see what happens when uh, a vol event takes over and people realize that they're in an untenable situation and I think everyone will will realize that all at once. And, and how will that manifest itself in the markets? What will happen? Yeah, I think, I think the yen will weaken uh, significantly, but, but what I'm talking about is a loss of confidence in the currencies, mm -hmm. kind of purchasing power. And you know, it means north of 200 in the yen well, to the dollar. Right? It's 200. A, I think what you have to realize is when your debts are 24 times your central government tax revenue, and you have a secular decline in population and all of the things are finally catching up to you, what happens when you have a debt crisis? Well, your currency collapses. The, the currency is the discounted present value of the, of the future interest rates, and I think interest rates finally take off. And we're actually one of the few people in the world that, that believes their interest rates can move, mm -hmm. and we think they're going to move uncontrollably once the yen really starts to move in, in a disorderly way. And what are the ramifications beyond Japan? I think so outside of the financial aspect of things you have the you have the mm, the more personal aspect of things you have the you have a third of the Japanese population is over the age of 60 you have almost a quarter of the, over the age of 65 at a point in time in in these people's lives in which they need their retirement savings I think they're going to lose 30 to 50 percent of their savings so it's going to be a social problem and right? this is going to be a problem that has wide-ranging ramifications from a social perspective. I think the social fabric of the country will be torn. It will be stretched or torn, and that will have uh, very large kind of global implications. But if you take the time to realize that there is no way out for Japan, in my opinion, there is no way out. And so it's a matter of if and not when, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, when and not if, excuse me. Um, and, and I think when you get to this point where you realize, well, if there's no way out for them, then there really is no way out for the rest of us. You want to get your money out of the yen, because if the yen's about to collapse, your purchasing power is about to collapse. But the longer term answer to your question is, when you think about these periods of time, the insidious nature of a, of a runaway inflation is it, it bankrupts the middle class. So the poor stay poor, the middle class, the, the doctors, the lawyers, the civil servants that have saved their money and put it in the bank, that those are the people that get wiped out in the in these kinds of or let's say severely harmed in these situations the people the wealthy that are actually levered with productive assets actually do the best so the rich stay rich the middle class gets wiped out and the poor stay poor that's an awful scenario for for the world to engage in well and countries go to war yeah if we go back a couple yeah. of decades that's exactly what's so happening right. in germany yeah it's um it's it's a sad state of things, but if you really follow this to its logical conclusion, it means social unrest globally, and it, it's a problem. It seems the radiation denial, not limited to Japan, of course, and the fiscal and population crises, have Japan caught between an all-out assault by two equally terrifying mutated beasts, like some kitschy Godzilla movie. But unlike in a good Godzilla yarn, this time, the people overwhelmingly and amazingly seem to be too paralyzed to run or react. The second birthday of the great Tohoku earthquake, tsunami and radiation disaster is an unhappy one. The Japanese and US governments and the mainstream press have been eagerly pushing their own agenda of what the anniversary should be about. Emotive remembrances, thoughtful looking ceremonies designed to comfort and provide closure. Yet what they are really trying to do is to frame the narrative so that 311 and the Fukushima disaster remains in the past tense and does not compromise nuclear power, which is a front for the production of plutonium for nuclear weapons. The very reality of the Fukushima story is at stake with a life or death struggle between the captured mainstream media and the ad hoc but passionate Fukushima truth movement. Framing the meltdown as being nothing too serious and having people believe it will result in many more needless casualties and raises the odds further of a nuclear end of the world as we know it. As 311 hits the terrible twos, smaller but myriad voices must shout out in greater collaborative numbers 
that the Fukushima disaster is not over and that it continues to kill and tear apart the great nation of Japan and is still contaminating the oceans and nations, populations and ecosystems downwind of it. The radiation already released is not escaping to some inconsequential away place. It is being assimilated into our biosphere as I speak these words, destroying it from the subatomic level upward. However horrifying this seems to decent people, it is entirely consistent with policy initiatives at the very top of the power structure. The United Nations has a terrible track record when it comes to preventing genocide and a competent record of encouraging them. In Rwanda in 1994, the UN allowed the mass killing of anything from 800,000 to 1 million plus people in ethnic cleansing by withdrawing and not reinforcing its troops when its own observers were reporting the beginnings of the genocide. Similarly, the US stood unmoved in light of the killings. There are of course good people too in the organization, but those who are promoted to the top and those in charge of policy ensure the agenda is anything but good. Dennis Halliday resigned his post as UN's Assistant Secretary General in 1998, as he declared that we are waging a war through the United Nations on the people of Iraq. We're targeting civilians. Worse, we're targeting children. What is this all about? The policy of economic sanctions is destroying an entire society. 5,000 children are dying every month. I don't want to administer a program that satisfies the definition of genocide. Over a million Iraqis died, including 500,000 children as a result of United Nations policy. This was all before, of course, the second US invasion in 2003. The lack of response from the UN to Fukushima is commensurate with these past episodes. The fact that Fukushima radiation may hurt the whole planet has not yet merited much UN concern. After all, the UN is planning what they call neo-humanity, in which humans are replaced by artificial intelligence, cybernetics, nanotechnology, and other emerging technologies. As far-fetched as this sounds, this transhumanist venture at the very top of the United Nations is deadly serious policy. The world is on the verge of global change. We are facing the choice to fall into a new dark age, into affliction and degradation, or to find a new model for human development and create not simply a new civilization, but a new mankind. It is clear that today's revolution will also require the deepest social transformation. The world's community and leaders should encourage mankind instead of wasting resources on solving momentary problems. Humanity does not have a master plan of its development. It seeks stability. It lives in the present and does not plan. To break the deadlock, the Russia 2045 movement was founded. It is a mega project intended to reach new heights and meanings. We intend to create a new vector for civilization, aimed at constant human development and evolution. As happened with the mega projects of the last century, the nuclear and the space programs, our forecast for the next 40 years. 2012 to 2013, the global economic and social crises are exacerbated. The debates on the global paradigm of future development intensifies. New transhumanist movements and parties emerge. Russia 2045 transforms into World 2045. New centers working on cybernetic technologies for the development of radical life extension rise. The race for immortality starts. 2015 to 2020, the avatar is created. A robotic human copy controlled by thought via brain-computer interface. It becomes as popular as a car. Transhumanism is and has always been a very exclusive club, as it is born of eugenics and drastic depopulation. So that this technocratic elite can merge with machines and computers, transcending their biological limits, 
consider this quote from the initiative for the United Nations ECHO 92 Earth Charter. The present vast overpopulation, now far beyond the world carrying capacity, cannot be answered by future reductions in the birth rate due to contraception, sterilization and abortion, but must be met in the present by the reduction of numbers presently existing. This must be done by whatever means necessary. The lack of response to the radiation slow killing of the people of the world makes much more sense now. The United Nations, like any organization controlled by elite banking families, has no incentive to move on Fukushima and all the motivation to ignore it. The truth of Fukushima and what it reveals about our political leaders is grim to say the least. Transfer one's personality to an alternative carrier. The epoch of cybernetic immortality begins. Bodies made of nanorobots that can take any shape arise alongside hologram bodies. For the man of the future, war and violence are unacceptable. The main priority of his development is spiritual self-improvement. A new era dawns. The era of neo-humanity. But that truth also sheds light on and crystallizes clearly what is now truly important. Perhaps we do need to embody a revised activist version of Japanese gaman to endure what is unbearable, to the very end, to inform everyone of what is coming and organize accordingly in what are, no doubt, conditions of the greatest adversity. This is a war not of armies and bullets, but a war by other means, waged on us by the release of deadly radiation shrouded over and maintained by collusive corporate and deeply psychopathic interests invested deeply in our governments and media. Contrary to our initial verdict, a collaborative call of Gaman to fight against the lies of this enemy may get us something truly great, the survival of our planet and species as we know it. None of our current institutions, as they are currently structured, have the will to do anything about Fukushima, and therein lies the crux of our crisis, or perhaps the source of our opportunity. Our situation is dire, but it is not hopeless. In fact, it is probably only as hopeless as we permit it to be. Reykjavik, Iceland is where a government beholden to foreign banks trying to assign their monstrous debts onto the Icelandic taxpayer was toppled by a sustained, protracted, focused and popular velvet revolution with direct participatory democracy with a new constitution being hammered out by Icelanders. This revolution dubbed the kitchenware revolution since the protesters banged pots and pans outside the parliament was not reported on by any mainstream media nor referenced in any speeches by other world leaders as it stands as a blueprint for a successful and heretofore peaceful overthrow of an incumbent government with policies and participatory politics responsive to the people and unlike any other country to date criminal investigations of the bankers and its former Prime Minister. Icelanders were blind, but at least now, in the present, since the 2009 kitchenware revolution, they have found their way. Yeah, you're all this good, you're big and 
The earlier we act, the more that violence can be avoided or minimized. That is the violence of people dying from radiation, and the violence of rioting when people finally understand, albeit too late for myriad victims, why so many of them are dying. To do nothing, even to be discouraged or despondent in the face of Fukushima, is to actually invite and empower the violence and the genocide. What is required is a massive collaborative effort reminiscent of the Manhattan Project in Fukushima that applies all the world's technical, engineering and scientific expertise to alleviate the danger and minimize and manage the radiation release with working groups and teams developing ideas and applications in how to do this. What we have currently is a cash-strapped TEPCO negligent in the first place in permitting the conditions for the three meltdowns to occur and its subsequent botched handling of these meltdowns and is now charged solely with dealing with the cleanup and accountable to no one, not even the Japanese government, let alone the international community. However, Fukushima could easily become merely the tip of the iceberg as there are 23 nuclear reactors of similar design in the United States. Many of them have massive storages of spent nuclear fuel and are leaking radiation constantly. Just inviting some catastrophic man-made or natural disaster to become a sister of Fukushima. Besides the crazy blindness of Hanabi, another favourite festival predilection of the Japanese is the more introspective sight of illumination. Silent, static, colourful incandescences set against the dark of night. Unlike Hanabi that is all gratuitous smash and pomp, illumination, one could say, leaves the viewer time and quiet to contemplate and imagine what the lights may mean for them in the context of their previous experiences, be they joyful or otherwise. Illumination, as its very name suggests, may even allow us to perceive that which we could not before in the blinding light and noise of the day. In light of 311, like a metaphorical satellite radiation imaging that bathes a surveyed area in false colored light, to reveal areas of radioactive contamination normally invisible to the human eye. Illumination can now make us see, permit us cognizance of a new, increasingly dystopic representation of the truth. The truth that the light we could not see before, the ionizing radiation, is now in many places of the world, in the trees, in the soil, on pavements, and on and in our bodies. The Fukushima truth is terrifying, but it is also liberating. We could otherwise be marveling mindlessly at fireworks and football, denying that the radiation was ever there, let alone slowly killing us. We need not wait years or decades and wait for enough people and ecosystems to die horribly as occurred in Minamata. Fukushima radiation looks to be a much faster acting poison than that of Chernobyl and Minamata. Such is the magnitude and intercontinental spread of the radiation release. If we wake up to the reality of our situation, we can jump straight into a redress of grievances, convict the guilty, and work to end the war waged upon us by other means right now. We must learn to love to see what we cannot normally see or could not before bear to confront to ensure not just our own well-being but also to make secure the welfare of at least the next seven generations in a world where we still have the freedom to express ourselves this is our only obligation those fleeting glimpses of the ionizing lights of Fukushima 
in our midst, born of illumination, could very well still be our own doing, or better yet, perhaps, there could be a guide to what we must do, and from here where we must go, to make good on that pledge.